idea I want to bring in comes out of the idea of bringing in to the idea of um, genocide something that which, which was ignored in the UN definition. That is the idea of cultural genocide. And I want to introduce you another concept which I have invented and I'm trying to market and sell and copyright and get a, a corona for every time somebody <laughs> uses it. And it's called nomicide. Now I'm going to explain that term now. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's <coughs> let's pause on on uh, deliberate uh, genocide. And this is what Bernd originally asked me to talk about. So I'll dwell on this a little bit. It seems very clear, looking at the history of Nazi genocide, that genocide for the Nazi regime was not just a simple matter of racial hatred and trying to destroy because you hate. It's not as simple as that. It, was, it had a dimension which meant that they didn't just want to get rid of Jews from German society or even Europe. They wanted to wipe out a people and all its culture and everything about it which was treated like an infection, literally like a disease, literally like something that if you do not wipe it out it will contaminate culture, it will contaminate society. And therefore, that destruction didn't just involve physical destruction, it, it involved the cultural destruction of Jews. And this logic applied also to other ethnic groups regarded as degenerate, every symptom of their culture. Uh, if you look at the way the Nazis operated in occupied Poland, for example, you will see massive cultural destruction. They weren't content just to occupy. They wanted to bring, literally, one of the instructions was, we will educate Poles to the level where they, where they can understand our instructions no more. Their history, their sense of who they were, their, sense, their sacred places, their sacred treasures, their sense of identity had to be destroyed. Not just their physical people, their physical existence. And there are other groups, of course, within Nazi Germany who were persecuted. Now, whether we call them this genocide or not shows how difficult the term is. But it is absurd to see the Holocaust as the main focus of the Third Reich. And in fact, I say that because I once gave a talk in what's called the, um, the Wiener Institute in London, which was set up by emigre Jews after the Second World War. And there was a, a Jewish, I don't know quite what he was, but probably an academic, who after I talked, he said to me that the only and main purpose of the Third Reich was to destroy Jews. And I said, well, look, I'm very sorry, but I don't believe that that is true. I think that after the last Jew had been killed, there would have still been a Third Reich, and they would have carried on with a massive program of the reorganization of Europe, the restructuring of Europe, they would have built motorways right into Russia, they would have reorganized labor and technology and industry. The idea that the sole purpose of the Third Reich was to destroy Jews is a nonsense. I mean, it's a very natural thing to feel if you're a victim, but it's probably uh, painful to realize that your extinction is not really what they wanted. That was just the precondition for a massive social, political, technological, economic experiment in an entire civilization based on racial principles. And other groups have to be put in the picture who were also persecuted and partly exterminated. <laughs> Obviously communists, the famous order to kill commissars, uh, hu liberal humanists who protested, Catholics, Catholic humanists, Christian human, humanists, you all should know that also homosexuals were uh, persecuted with a bizarre piece of Nazi humour. They were given pink stars in the concentration camps, which I think is a pretty sick joke. Yeah? Um, the mentally handicapped, as you know, so-called hereditary uh, disease that was to be wiped out for reasons of Rassenhygiene, racial hygiene, alcoholics slovenly housewives. There were cases of women being denounced 
because they, 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 they did not tidy up their communal space properly. They were denounced as probably degenerates and they were hauled off to concentration camps. Uh, children, uh, in Poland, where blonde children were captured by the SS and then submitted to a racial test, which involved a biometric study of their eyes, skin colour, with all beautifully rational and, and scientific. One of the tests was the way you sat at a table. We're talking about eight, nine-year-old children here. And if they did not sit up straight, they were sent to a concentration camp and died. So these were serious psychopaths, but of course in a very organised state way. So the idea that the Nazis were just anti-Jewish is, I'm afraid, uh, a, a trivialisation of something much more major. They were fighting a war against degeneracy in all its forms, <laughs> in the name of a, of a regeneration, of a Aufnordung, of, of a re-nordification of the Germans, which would turn them into a, a, a racially, culturally, technologically superior race that would save civilization. Because civilization was falling apart, liberal democracy had failed, American capitalism was a disgrace, communism was evil, and so there was no hope but the Germans. Because you couldn't leave it to the French, and the Italians were hopeless, and the Spanish were pathetic. And it's only the Germans, and the poor old Norwegians have been so contaminated by liberal democracy that only a few of them were going to fight, so who, you've got to do it yourself. Now, the spirit in which this was carried out was that the German people, of course the word people there sounds quite innocent in English, but when you have the word folk, it starts getting a bit... In English, folk is associated with playing guitars and uh, acoustic in a pub with, with warm beer and sort of talk, singing about hey diddle diddle and stuff. But folk in German is a really different sort of concept. I don't know how... What folk is like in Norwegian, it's probably a bit between the two. Between, Norwegian yeah, compromise it's, it's, between... It's, it's between the two. Yeah, yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Because you're the great compromisers, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Systematically the, avoiding conflict. Yeah, between the Swedish and the Danish and the Germans and the Finns and all that. The, the only little island of common sense and natural. <laughs> okay. um, so it was not just a racial genocide, that's my point. We must expand this concept. When the Nazis were purging Germany, the German folk, of degeneracy, they conceived degeneracy in racial, genetic, ethnic, ideological, moral, spiritual and political decadence. Yeah? In other words... Genocide was not just a surgical operation like a sort of national health service doctor in England trying to get rid of degeneracy. This was a, a ritualistic act of purification. And this is my basic point. Um, <coughs> there was a dimension to the Nazi destruction which was, I, I'm going to come on to the fact, partly it was modern, scientific, scientific, carried out by doctors, carried out by bureaucrats, carried out by modern people, but deep down in the psyche there were things going on that really cannot be captured by ideas of modernity. This is a statement by a, a member of the Red Cross who visited Auschwitz in 1944. Because the Red Cross could only look after the fate of uh, soldiers and not of civilians at the time, he could say nothing about the illegality of Auschwitz. He talked to Hearst, and when this British reporter says to him, when you were with Hearst, why didn't you say that he should stop these terrible things? That's a very British reaction, isn't it? You, you go up to Hitler and say, Hitler, what are you doing? Come and have a glass of sherry and let's talk things over. Now, and this is how this French... A uh, member of the Red Cross answered, he says to John Simpson, the BBC reporter, he says, but you don't understand, these people were proud of their work. They were convinced of being engaged in an act of purification. They called Auschwitz the anus of Europe. They called Auschwitz the anus of Europe because Europe had to be cleansed. They were defecating Jews. 
They were, ter- they were, well, they say in German, eine Kläranlage. What do you call a sewage works? Kloak. 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 Yeah. Well, in German it's nice because it's Kläranlage. Klären means to clarify, clear. They take shit water and they turn it into clear water. Yeah? Kläranlage. Auschwitz was a Kläranlage. You took racial impurity in and you destroyed it. It was a bit like a sort of you, you were almost producing, you, you, were, you, were, you were like dustmen, you were like people cleaning up. They were responsible for the purification of Europe. If you cannot get your head around that, you will understand nothing at all. If you don't get your head around the fact that the, uh, that the genocide was an act of ritual purification, you will not understand what was going on in Auschwitz. This was not common sadism. This was not ordinary anti-Semitism. This wasn't just a sort of reaction of a home people against, you know, oh, I really don't like Jews. This wasn't not liking Jews. This was something far deeper. This was a deep attempt to save humanity from something which was considered by real Nazis. I'm not talking about ordinary Nazis. Uh, When Hitler got into power in 1933, they talked about, after the Enabling Act, they talked about the Merzgefallenen. These were people who became Nazis because they wanted to survive. They weren't genuine Nazis, they just opportunists, survivors, etc. I'm talking about hardcore Nazis, the believers. They were believers in a world that was falling apart (coughs) and had to be saved through genocide. So when you then look at Nazi racial discourse, you will actually see that it is a hybrid of two elements. One is modern, eugenic, it's called, by the way, scientistic. That's when you use science to justify things which are not scientific. Scientistic. So modern, eugenic, scientific notions of combating degeneracy, racial hygiene, social hygiene, um, you, you should be reminded of the fact that the word eugenic was invented by Galton, who was an Englishman at the end of the 19th century, who said actually that eugenics should be the religion of the future. That's what he said, Nine, 18, uh, 1895. That he believed that the future belonged to the healthy. This was England, dear old England, dear old London, dear old uh, University College London. Yeah? Now, the Germans took this idea to extraordinary heights. They were fighting degeneracy. However, this modern scientific language is blended simultaneously with an ancient, deeply ingrained racial and social hatreds, anti-Semitism, anti-Slavism, allophobia, that's a fear of something different. Allophobic, allos, Greek, phobia. And isn't it interesting psychologically how often fear turns into hatred? and violence. You know, you're frightened. So, for example, misogyny, which means hating women, is really a fear of women, because they're so much more intelligent and subtle and complex, and their brain uses so many more parts of itself uh, when, when it thinks. Because the, 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 the male brain thinks in only a few little lights come on. Not often one bit comes on a lot, and then little bits around it. Whereas, with, and so this fear of women can turn into hatred of women, can turn into male chauvinism, etc. So there's, there's a sort of fear of a whole load of otherness. Now, that, if anyone is interested in this or has the time, there is a remarkable book by Klaus Tieberle called Männerfantasien, or in English, Male Fantasies, which is a book that in England you would hide under your bed in case your mum finds it, because it's called Male Fantasies. But it's not about that sort of male fantasy. It is about the... Uh, Nazi mentality, the Klaus Tieberle. In two volumes of dense English, or German if you like, with lots of illustrations, which makes it better, he explores the way the Nazi mindset, and again we're talking about hardcore Nazis here, can be explained in terms of a little island of uh, vision, duty and idealism, surrounded by a sea an ocean of threats, women, the crowds, communists, chaos, fun, the, the sort of children, everything, basically. I mean, if you're in 
These people, he says, were not psychologically born. He calls them die noch nicht geborenen. These were people psychologically who were not yet born, so they only felt real in a uniform. Please, ladies here, beware of men who only feel real in a uniform. Okay? And so, these people were so paranoid about so many things they could not control, they create this generalized them and us situation. Which, by the way, in, uh, in religious language is called Manichaean. A Manichaean universe is split between good and evil. And you obviously tend to, unless you're a Satanist, you identify with the good. If you're a Satanist, you say, this is bad, and I'm going with the bad. But most people make good and bad, I'm going to be good. And then you have a mission, and your mission is to save the world from the bad. And different people have different bads, as it were. One of the concepts which was really scary, as we say in English, uh, frightening in German, was Gemeinschaftsfähige or Unfähige. Is this person capable of being part of the German Volksgemeinschaft? Is he, we've got a lovely word in English, clubbable. Is this man capable of drinking with me in my club? That's part of the 19th century elite English thing. An awful lot of politics was done in male clubs. Okay? This is sort of not clubbable, but communi communityable. Is this person part of the Gemeinschaft or not? If you are a loner, if you like jazz and not swing, if you had slightly subversive ideas, if you looked a bit Jewish or dark, or well, you might not, you might be one of them. You might be from the dark side. Incidentally, Timothy McVeigh, who blew up the Oklahoma uh, Murray Building, Murrah Building in 1995, one of his key films was Star Wars. Dark Planet, Luke Skywalker, loner with his weird animals, going to fight the Dark Star, which for him was Zog, Zionist Occupation Government, Federal State, United Nations, uh, the White House. Can you imagine the mindset? So, these Nazis had to purge the world of all these various uh, people who didn't fit in. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. I mean, if anybody meets a Jehovah's Witness, and I presume they exist in Norway, and feels he'd like to do something nasty, well, the Nazis did. In fact, when Himmler had to rebuild the castle in Wewelsburg as the centre of his occult Nazi realm, he had the work done not by Jews, because Jews were too impure to work on his mystic castle. He had all the work done by Jehovah's Witnesses, who were then all killed at the end. Isn't that nice? So next time you have a bad builder, you know what to do. Okay. Um, so the Nazi crusade, the Nazi war against degeneracy, Entartung, is the corollary, it's the, it's the flip side, it's the other side of the Nazis' belief in heroin supremacy and the need of another concept for you, a modern gardening state. What is a gardening state? Well, one of my great, great intellectual heroes is a guy called Zygmunt Bauman, who despite his name is not German, he's Polish. And uh, he's schizoid Polish-English, and he spends half his time in Warsaw and half his time in... Leeds University, and he's written hundreds of books on modernity. And one of his main concepts in one of the books, a book called Modernity and Ambivalence, is that in the modern age, things get messy, chaotic, and complicated. Some people can't stand ambivalence. Some states, some modern states, instead of just running society and making it as human as possible, they see their role as tidying up cleaning up. They see the, the, the society as a, as a, like a, what we call in English, a wasteland. And a vista. We've got a word like that? Oh, there you are. Yeah? Now, what do you do with a wasteland? If you buy a, a rubbish old house with a big garden that has been left for a long, long time, you cut things down, you make bonfires, you burn things, 
you pile things up, you put new things in. If your idea of the state is that society is a uster, what do you call it? Okay. Okay. Desert. Desert. Then you start doing all this gardening with people in Mein Kampf, in the first chapter of Mein Kampf. Hitler talks about well, he talks about ruthlessly cutting away the bad weeds, the weeds. Weeds are bad grass, unkult, yeah? Which is funny, in English, because Kraut is what we call Germans, unkult could mean un-German. No, in German it means a weed, and he uses the gardening metaphor for what the German state must do. It must create a garden, but gardens, you know, in England at least, Gardening in England is a psychopathological activity. <laughs> <laughs> they're killing slugs, they're throwing things away, they're cutting things down, they're burning things. If they have a very bad relationship with their husband, they take it out on the garden. Well, <laughs> Hitler saw his function, as did Stalin, as, as did Mussolini, as did Mao. They saw their society as a resource to be cut to <coughs> shape. Right? Now, this modern gardening state contains a deeper substratum of religious ritual logic related to slaughter, schlachten in German, as sacrifice. Now, this has a big history. There's a wonderful book on the Rwandan genocide called Sacrifice as Terror, which goes into the anthropology of how they killed each other. They, I mean, I won't go into it, but it's really fascinating. There's, they, they were ritually killed. This was not normal killing. If a burglar comes into your house and you shoot him, you've killed him. But when you kill somebody in a particular way, this is ritual. This has got, this has got old stuff going on, not modern. Uh, the, the, in the letter found in the luggage of one of the 9-11 bombers called Atta, Mohammed Atta, uh, there's a letter that all the bombers had, and it's a letter saying, remember, you've got to do this, you've got to kill these people, and when you kill them, they use the Arabic word for the ritual slaughter of an animal. Not the normal word for to kill, but the killing of an animal for ritual slaughter. They talk about the passengers who will be killed giving themselves up for sacrifice. Because the whole act of 9-11 was a sacred act. Sacred. Sacred. One of the most terrifying and beautiful drives in human beings is the ability to create or out of ordinary space and time something sacred. That can produce cathedrals, works of art, beautiful music, but it can also create ritual death. Uh, the Noah legend. Let's wipe out the world and then one family survives, you know, blow all these people who are drowning. Uh, there's a wonderful, look it up on the web, Master Panol, if you want to see a wonderful example of a Romanian sacrifice myth, you'll know that when we launch a ship in England, do you do it in Norway, you break a bottle? Well, in modern England, it used to be champagne, now it's probably uh, Lucasade or something from, from uh, some mo or Pepsi Cola. But that was originally red wine, and that was originally blood. Every time you built a bridge, or a boat, you had to sacrifice something because you, any big enterprise needs magic and you make the magic through death. You need ritual slaughter to make something work. There is a terrifying cathartic logic. Cathartic comes from the Greek for to clean, to cleanse, to make things pure. Une purification. This is the idea that you, you don't just... I mean, when my Italian wife cleans the house, she doesn't just clean it, it's like, oh my God, I mean, I'm frightened to walk into it. The space has been purged. It's like, this is a war on dirt. There's an, there's an Italian condition, condition called rupophobia, which is a morbid fear of dirt. Some people have elaborate rituals in lavatories, so as they don't touch public lavatories, and they go into all sorts of acrobatic conditions, because there is a terrifying... Fear of there's if you're married to an Italian like I am, there are all sorts of amazing rituals and and 
uh, fears. There's a fear of money because money is dirty. And so if you uh, if it, if you've been touching money, you have to scrub your. You don't just wash your hands. In England, we wash our hands. No, in Italy, you scrub your hands. You get diseases and. So there's a mythic layer of consciousness in human beings about dirt and cleansing, which is not just <coughs> functional, it's ritual. Uh, if we carry on, in the First World War, all the combatants in the First World War had this extraordinary cult of death. In England, we had uh, individual battalions being ashamed of how few soldiers they'd lost. They were, they were, they were proud if they lost a lot of men. They were ashamed if they didn't lose many men, because the more blood, the more purification. There's this very ancient idea that if, pe if men die, their blood will somehow purify the earth. This is really good stuff. But to the extent that communism is the child of the Enlightenment, and the idea that you can plan a rational <laughs> future, and that you can, it, it is within, actually it goes back to Ficino, uh, the um, Marsilius Ficino, the the Christian humanist, who in a wonderful thing called De Dignitate Hominis, on the dignity of man in the 15th century, says, God has allocated every animal to a place in the chain of being, but human beings have no fixed place in the world. They can either descend to the level of the animals or raise, rise to the level of the angels. They have to fix their position in the world for themselves. Now, this is brilliant and beautiful. It is also terrifying. Once human beings get the idea that they can reshape the world to their dreams, then you can get totalitarian regimes and you can get social engineering and you can get experiments on twins in Auschwitz and you can, you can get gulags and the whole thing. So I believe that to the extent that uh, totalitarianism is a child of the Enlightenment, it is... Uh, it is in the case of communism, but in the case of Nazism, it is a radical rejection of rationality in the Enlightenment. That the essence of, be of human beings is not in their individual atomized reason, but in their blood. in blue. It's in their race, it's in history. It's, they wanted a rooted modernity, they wanted a technocratic explosion into the future with deep roots into the German soul. And they actually took seriously things like Volksseele, not Volksgeist, Volksseele. And if you talk to or read Norwegian racists and, and Nazis, and there were some, uh, it's the same idea. There's something ur in German. Yeah, ur in, yeah. There's something ur about every race. And I, I, I think... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know how you do it if you're Danish, but I can see that if you're Norwegian, you can get very ur, can't you? Especially in a dark winter, and then you get have to get pretty ur. Then you're nothing but ur. Yeah, then you're only ur and a bottle. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't get you through. Can you point before opening up? Uh, if then, then it follows logically. Then democracy is the epitome of ambivalence and pluralism. Yeah, and as a result, the object of hate. Democracy, I mean, liberalism is an amazing invention. Thomas More in Utopia says, wouldn't it be nice to be on an island where people do not torture each other because they are of different religions? Just a fantastic idea. I mean, he had his head chopped off uh, because he wouldn't sign the papers to allow one of our many bastard kings, called Henry VIII, to divorce. But Thomas More had this great idea, and he called this book Utopia. Yeah? Uh, we have, through a lot of suffering, uh, created a sort of utopia. I mean, when, when Thatcher had to leave, she didn't shoot anybody and she wasn't shot. She cried and left. Or as we say in English, buggered off. Okay? Uh, and that is the triumph of liberal democracy. You have conflict, you have people you hate, you, you have policies you don't like, but you put up with it. And you put up with it because the world is complex, it's big, there are millions of different isms, every person in this room has his or her own values and emotions, and we just, liberal democracy is a way of tolerating the fact that you can't have your own way. It's a bit, I have a spoilt son because he's, uh, he's an only child, and he's a... Yeah. But if you, if, you, if you have a big family and you only have one iPad, you have to make arrangements, or you breed a psycho who kills all the members of the family. So in a way, what people like Hitler 
and Mussolini and Stalin said, what they rejected was the idea of multivalence, ambivalence, chaos and confusion. And with education, you can teach people to deal with those impulses, to want it one way, to have what you want, to, that there's only one truth, etc., etc. But that only works for some people. And I'm afraid, for, I mean, the, I think the, the psychological transition that Breivik went through from quite an ordinary, normal, rather sort of work to, to that, it's just fascinating because um, it, it, it's, it shows just how, I mean, the book that you, you've waved at people, um, The Terrorist Creed, oh, yeah. I mean, I had to write this unintelligible book to write this book, but this, is, this book's quite good. Um, and, and what I like about it is that I've tried to locate this um, th this attempt to resolve the complexity of the world into something simple, to tidy up, to clean up, to, to, to get rid of all the stuff that's suppressing you. And I've tried to locate that, not within pathology or evil or, or criminality, but something which actually, in other circumstances, we love. The ability of a mother to die for her child or protect her, the, of people sacrificing themselves for their, their country or whatever. The ability of human beings to live for an ideal, to do something which transcends their life, this is, can be fabulous, but it can be so terrifying. So, liberal democracy for me is a terrible system, but it's better than any other.